Come to us. Take take a seat, please, beside uh, beside uh, Pajavali. Oh, there you are. Very strange names to get around. Now, ladies and gentlemen, these are all members of the Hare Krishna movement. To give it its full title, it's the International Society for Krishna Consciousness. And uh, since it is uh, Krishna being God, and it's uh, Hindu based, and of course it originates in uh, in India. And uh, one of their basic tenets is they believe in reincarnation. That is to say, that when we die in this life. We come back in another life, and depending on how we've led our lives in this life, whether we've been good or bad, so we reap the benefits and the just rewards of that. And generally speaking, we are, are in a series of lives, the situation is balanced out between good and evil, uh, nice times and bad times, and eventually you reach the nirvana or heaven or paradise uh, for all eternity. Now, we have, first of all, in the first panel seat, we have uh, Mother Pajavali. And uh, she was born in Newfoundland of Irish parents, and she was originally a Roman Catholic. And in the center, we have Prithu Das, who is from Germany, and he was originally a Catholic, and he is the in charge of the Dublin house of Hare Krishna. And finally, we have Davanala, who is from County Antrim, and he was a member of the Church of Ireland before he joined the movement. Now, uh, Prithu, can you tell me, please, you are all monks. Yeah, that's a fact. We are monks. We practice very strict sadhana or regulative principles like uh, every member of our society gets up very early at three o'clock 
We are meditating three hours in the morning on the names of God. We chant the names of Krishna. We understand that God can be approached by chanting his name. And uh, we have four basic regulative principles. That means all our members, they do not eat meat, fish, or eggs. They're non-violent. They uh, do not uh, take tea, coffee, alcohol, cigarettes, any intoxication like drugs. They uh, do not gamble. They don't waste time by gambling. And also, they don't eat fish, meat, fish, or eggs. Also, they pr practice uh, celibacy. All our members are practicing celibacy. These are the four basic regulatory principles. And after this very early morning uh, regimentation, what do you do then for the rest of the day? Well, everybody of our members understands that uh, real religion, pure religion means to understand that God owns everything. And because of that, uh, we use everything in the service of God. Our body, our mind, our intelligence, our time, we use in the service of God. Now everybody has different capacity. One person may be uh, more intellectually inclined, another one may be more practical. So Krishna consciousness means to use whatever talent is given by God in the service of God, and that 24 hours a day. And you operate this house in Mountjoy Square, and, and you repair it and, and, and keep it going yourself? Yes, some of our people, they're cooking, some are cleaning, some are translating, some are uh, giving lectures at the universities, some are mm. doing the gardens. Everybody has an engagement according to his capacity. Yes, and, and who keeps all of this going financially? Where does the money come from? <laughs> That's the question many people ask us. Now, we have three sources of income. First of all, uh, not every one of our members is living in our temple, in our center. We have a lot of people, they work in society, like you could actually be a Hare Krishna. Nobody knows that you are Hare Krishna. You could chant Hare Krishna, the names of God. You could read our philosophy. You could uh, help us financially. And uh, in this way, you could be related to the Krishna conscious movement. So the first uh, source of income are our members who may have all kinds of different occupations and who help us financially. But, but is it true that to become a lay member, that is to stay in the world doing your job as an accountant or a factory worker in an office or whatever, that you are required to pay 50% of your salary? 50%, yeah. Most 50%. of our members give much more. Most of your members yeah. give much more. Then we have a second uh, kind of income. We have many uh, members from India. After all, we are the a center for the Indian community, they come uh, to our Hare Krishna temple at their place of worship and they help us financially. And the third kind of income is that we are distributing books and records and we are collecting donations and in this way we maintain ourselves. Quite. Mother Pajavali, um, when did you uh, first decide after your, your Catholic upbringing that uh, Hare Krishna was, was what you wanted? Well, I had been working in the business world for about 15 years. I was an accountant, an auditor, and I was searching and looking for something very... I knew there must be a source of real knowledge somewhere. So I had read in all directions for almost 10 years after I'd uh, finished school, just trying to understand. And the basic questions of who am I and what is death and where is, where, what's it all about and what's happening to everyone and where are all the people that were here 50 years ago or 100 years ago, and where does everyone go when they leave this place? And all these basic questions that every person has in his mind and heart, and there's no information. So in 1971, um, I left the business world and struck out to find out what is it that, that is existing within us all. And I met a devotee on the street about a year later, and he gave me Prabhupada's books, the Bhagavad Gita, Srimad Bhagavatam. So for the next two years I studied the books and I read constantly and I uh, lived very simply and I tried to understand what, what the purports meant. And by um, reading the Bhagavad Gita, which is the, one of the oldest books in existence and almost all persons of, um, uh, who are looking for things find the Bhagavad Gita and uh, uh, Thoreau, Emerson, and all the great thinkers have come to the Bhagavad Gita. And, and in the house in Mount Joy Square now, um, do you do play a strictly female role insofar as do the men cook or do the women cook? We both cook. You both cook? Yes. And, and do, you, do you serve the men, as it were, or, or do you all muck in together? <laughs> well, it depends on who's serving that day. 
it's it's not it's not it's a natural thing actually, and it's also we are preachers and we all work very cooperatively together, and so it's a it's a yoga system, and uh, so there's a, sometimes a misunderstanding with uh, our movement that that it, you know the men are superior and the women are inferior kind of thing, but actually it's not like that. It's a yoga system, and even children can participate. And there's no, there's no difference in the system whether it's for men or for women or for children. Yes. Um, Prithu, when you said that you all practice celibacy, um, sh- surely there are married couples in your house. Yes. Yeah, in married life, we uh, may practice uh, sex life for the production of children. Otherwise, there's no sex life. For example, if somebody's married, uh, if he wants to have children, he has a sex life with his wife, but otherwise there is no sex life. He lives in celibacy as well. In other words, like I said before, the basic principle is to understand that our body is also the property of God. It is a temple of God. And a devotee, he uses his body only for the sake. The whole problem today with religion is that people don't understand what is actually the position of God. If they would understand that God owns everything, Every penny in this country is a property of God. Every brick in this country is a property of God. Every piece of land is actually the property of God. Our body is a property of God. Whatever may be in our belongings is in our property of God. And if this, these things will be used in the service of God, that is pure devotional life. You were brought up a Catholic, and it seems to me that you're, you're saying that the body is the temple of the Holy Ghost is pure Catholic doctrine, as, as, as you well know. What did you find unsatisfactory about the Catholic faith? which made you turn away from it. Well, the point is, Krishna consciousness, Krishna means God in Indian language, and consciousness means being conscious. So Krishna consciousness means to be conscious of God. Now, like I explained, in this society, we can see that people are not very conscious of God. They're misusing the money in this world by flying rocket ships to the moon, collecting dust. They are uh, aborting children. We see in the United States, we had more than 1.5 million abortions in the last year. Because they don't understand that everything is a property of God. They're misusing the earth, they're creating wars. Everyone is takes, taking as much as he likes, not understanding that when everything is a property of God, everyone should actually take only what he needs for his maintenance and not anything more. But all of that would be contained in the Catholic doctrine. And it, 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 I, what, I'm, what I'm wondering about is why you didn't become a, a Catholic monk, for example. Would that not have been as satisfying... It is uh, contained in the teachings of Lord Jesus Christ, that one should give up everything and serve him. Yes. But if you see the practical point in modern society, uh, religion doesn't mean to go to church and throw 20p in the box and go to mass. Religion means to use every minute in the service of God. Say, for example, somebody is a farmer. I do not say that he should leave his family, shave his head and join our society like that. He can live at home, he can grow his potatoes, he can plow the fields, and he makes, say, 10,000 pounds. So he needs to maintain his family in a very simple way, say 1,000, 2,000, or 3,000. In the rest, 7,000 he should use for the service of God. In this way, whenever he's plowing the field or whatever material work he may do, he's actually serving God because he uses the fruits of his work for the propagation of consciousness of and, God. And, and he would give a major portion of his uh, earnings, of his money, to the church. He should give whatever is left yeah. for the service of God. No, about well, there isn't, you know, there isn't a Catholic priest in the country who would disagree with you about that. Well, yeah, that, that's a fact. He wouldn't surely not disagree. Very practical point. But uh, we have to see if this is actually practiced. If we see in today's society, it is not practiced at all. For example, God is surely not a Hindu. God is not a Catholic. God is not a Jew. That's a fact. Real religion means that God is the father of everyone, that the soul is not Catholic, the soul is not a Hindu, the soul is not a Jew, the soul has really nothing to do with these religions. The soul is just a servant of God and has to serve God all the time. Now, if it comes down to the point of I'm Catholic, I'm a Hindu, I'm a Jew, I'm a socialist, I'm a capitalist, I'm a German, I'm an American, these are simply bodily designations. As soon as a living entity identifies with the body, I'm the body. Not understanding that his soul 
Then immediately he tries to accomplish so many things on the material platform. He tries to raise money. He tries to become rich. He becomes, tries to become wealthy. He tries to become famous. And all these things are from our point of view, from the point of view of a devotee, simply garbage. Because at the point of death, all these things won't help him to attain the eternal kingdom of God. It's a waste of time. Even Lord Jesus Christ said, what profit in man if he gains the kingdom of earth and loses his eternal soul? Now you say that this is practiced in our religion here in this country or in India. This is not a fact at all. Religion has become very material. People don't serve God. They're going into the cinema, they're going into the pubs, they misuse the money of God at every second. Isn't it a fact? Um, uh, uh, Davanala, uh, uh, do you watch television? No, we simply don't watch television at all. Radio? Uh, no radio either. Newspapers? Magazines? Um, some, we will, sometimes we have a newspaper because we like to know what's going on also in the world. I hear every day the news. Yeah. Mm. Uh, you never go on holiday? Well, there's no need to go on holiday because the one's enjoying what he's doing, well, there's a need to go on a holiday. <laughs> yes. And, and uh, the, uh, would you say there's a large number or the, give us an indication of the, of the proportion of Irish people who join? Well, actually, the greatest majority of our members are all Irish. Oh, I here you mean. Yeah. I, I was given to understand that, that if, if somebody from Ireland joined, they would be posted to one of your houses overseas. Mm. And that no. Not, not necessarily. They, are, they can They're lift all... up their hand. Who is Irish? Lift up your They're hand. They're all Irish. Oh, no, most of them are Irish. Yes. Yes, most of them are Irish. <laughs> yes. Um, and and it, it seems to be a, a terribly strict way of life. But the point is, if a person is spiritually satisfied... If he actually finds pleasure in his own heart, he doesn't need all these material gadgets and all these material assets. It is only on accord of having not realized the beauty of the relationship between God and the living entity that we are looking in this material world for happiness. Prithu, have, would you have now completely rejected, for example, the doctrine of the virgin birth? No, the point is, uh, this is not included in our philosophy directly. But uh, in the Vedic scriptures, if we study, it is a fact that many incarnations of Krishna have been taken birth by virgin uh, birth. It is not unusual. So there's no reason for us, as we recognize Lord Jesus Christ as a son of Krishna, there's no reason for us to doubt that there's virgin birth. It may be or not, it is not included in our philosophy, but we have no reason to doubt. But was your Krishna born of a virgin birth? Yes. Yeah. He was. It's a fact, yes. And, and other religions you've come across also preach the doctrine? Uh, I don't know so much about Islam, actually. I don't know what point of view they take. That is not our field. Yeah. We are authorities on the more in the Indian history, in the Indian literature, Fine. Vedic literature. Yes, yes sir. Um, yeah. I'd like to ask you, do you accept the Blessed Trinity, the Father, Son and the Holy Spirit? Well, we have something similar. Uh, we understand... No, the real thing, I don't understand something similar. Do you accept it or do you not? It is not part of our philosophy. We accept that the Lord is there, the Father is there. We say Krishna. We accept that there's a spirit, the Holy Spirit in our, our heart, which we call Paramatma or Super Soul. And we uh, understand that the Son is there, the representative of God in this world, the Guru, the spiritual master, who takes upon himself the sins of his disciples to save him from this material but, world. Then and do, you, do you accept that Jesus Christ died on the cross for a demon save us? He, uh, as far as Lord Jesus Christ died on the cross is concerned, it is, we are Hindus. We, not Hindus. We are, as far as Lord Jesus Christ died on the cross is concerned, it is not part of our philosophy. You don't accept it? We accept that Lord Jesus Christ, for, Christ died for the sins of the people at that time who followed him. There's no doubt about it. But he didn't die on that the cross is, for demon service. That is the duty of the spiritual master to take upon himself the sins of his followers. Would you have so, believed, would you believe that Jesus Christ was God? Would you believe in No, divinity? we wouldn't say that. Wouldn't He's a, the son of God. He never said that he was God. He's the son of God. I think there's quite a difference. He did. He did actually. Point of view. Um, yes, sir. In, in all the, the funds you take off your members, 50 or 75 percent, is there any situation where you have to give any of them back if they need it? We have uh, fed in the last year around 15,000 people in our center. Every day we're feeding at 6 o'clock people. We are feeding people every Sunday afternoon. We went to so many different festivals in Ireland. Do you mean non-members, non Prithu? Non-members. Just people 15, who come into 15, your house? 15,000, yes. yes. And we distributed literature free for 20,000 pounds in the last year. In other words, uh, 
if we get a certain amount of money, we take also, according to the same principle, what we actually need for the maintenance of our house, and you will never see us smoking a cigarette or going into the movie. We live very simple. And the rest we give back. It's given by the people of Ireland in the form of donations, and we give it back in the form of books, literature, free food. That is our duty. God has a good reputation in Ireland. Well, that is a fact. God has a very good reputation in Ireland. Ireland is nice. People like spiritual people. In yes. general, we have very good uh, uh, resonance, very good <coughs> resonance. By Someone the from the audience, the question was asked from the audience as to what about the shaven head and the mark on the, on the, on the face, and the, the answer was simply that it's no more, no less than the tonsure of a, of a, of a, a Catholic monk. I, I seem to have the impression, Prithu, that most of your recruits over here are remarkably young. Yes. Is there a particular reason or... What? Well, it is easy to understand that uh, if old trees, you can't bend them, they break. So young people in general, they're more open-minded. They are inquisitive. They want to know what is actually going on. They're not uh, tracked down mm. to a certain understanding. Young people especially, they want to know what it is all about, what is the goal of life, what is the meaning of life, what is it all about that I have to go to the factory and work like crazy, for nothing, understanding that the material energy that goes into the factory in form of materials come out the factory improved, whereas a person who goes in the factory comes out degraded. They see that the society doesn't give them any peace, and those have tried to find this peace by uh, inquiring about the absolute truth. And so we give them good answers. Is, what would happen if we all did that? To which the repast is, well, we don't all do it. Well, the point is, it is not needed, like I explained already before, that everybody shaves his head. Everybody can stay in his respective position, but he should use his time, yeah. uh, his energy, to serve God. Yes. He should not take these things for himself. Mr. Murphy, you, you had something yes. down there. I'd just like to ask, is it difficult to leave this organization or religion if one wanted to oh, leave yes. it? Yes, what about the chaps who join or the girls who join and say, after a year, no, this is not for me. Yeah, Forget they, they can go at any time. Anytime. The house door is always open. If you want to join at any time, you're welcome. If you want to go at any time, you will. Well, of course, we like to have people as ourselves, but still. All right, then. I was, I was looking for volunteers to, to you know what GIB stands for. Government Information Bureau. What else? Government Information Bureau. What was it you said, Mr. Casey? Oh, come on. Try it. Don't be shy. You've been all around the world, for heaven's sake. Go on, say it. I won't. Spit it out. I'll tell you what he said. He said good in bed, and he's remarkably right. This, this is Wendy Lee, this lady here. And Wendy Lee is an English ing lit university graduate from Canterbury who joined BBC and ITV as a researcher, God between us and all harm. And she then has written two books about women and men called Good in Bed. In other words, she is inquiring about what, for example, makes a man good in bed. They all shrink into their seats now a little further. And you don't have to start giggling straight away. It's a perfectly serious book. And the idea was that she went, uh, she went around talking to people, to men and women, uh, asking this very important question. And I felt that Irish lads are as interested in this as anybody else because they take this job very seriously, you see. And, um, and so, I mean, did you actually go round, Wendy, talking to famous people and asking them I did, questions? but before I explain all about that, can I tell you where GIB came from? Because it was my invention. I started writing this book, and it was originally called, the first book was originally called, What Makes a Woman GI Good in Bed? What Makes a Woman Good in Bed? What Makes a Woman Good in Bed? And I was staying with my 85-year-old grandmother, and I thought, wait a minute, she may not like the idea of her little granddaughter dealing in this type of a subject. So I used to abbreviate and put GIB, and sooner or later, she finally discovered what GIB meant, insisted on reading the book, and said to me, if I'd have read this book 70 years ago, my whole life might have been different. So that is my source of GIB. Good for her. So you went around now. D is it true that the original idea came through, if not from, Richard Burton, no less? Yes, because I was a researcher at BBC, and I was sent to interview Burton when he was playing the part of Churchill at Chartwell, and I believe he even thought he was Churchill at that moment in time. he just divorced Elizabeth Taylor for, I think, the first time, and I'd already promised my friends diamonds. I imagined great romance and passion, and I was 21 years old, and I arrived with my little list of 21-year-old journalist questions. And Burton, seeing this little gushing thing, looked me up and down and said, Right, I have got a golden award for the first journalist to ask me a question I've never been asked before, and I don't think you are going to get it. And I just crawled away and cried. And then I stopped and I thought, well, wait a minute. 
Maybe celebrities are bored with being asked about their latest record, their latest film. Why not ask them something about the about which the world is eternally curious? So you did? Yes. And oh. Burton was one of my first interviewees. And did you win the award? I don't think we discussed the award. He was too busy telling me what he thought makes a man G.I.B. So what, what, what does he think? Well, Burton uh, stresses something that I think is very important and, and worries a lot of men and annoys a lot of women, which is that men find it very difficult, even in this day and age, to know how to approach a woman. That even though, you know, we're led to believe by the media that sex is available, men still find it hard to know just how to come on to a woman. Because really, 20 years ago, if a woman had said no to a woman, a man could have said to himself, OK, she's a virgin, she doesn't have sex. Nowadays, if a woman says no, in most cases, a man takes it personally. So therefore, he's more afraid of rejection and doesn't know how to approach a woman. Burton says, you should tell every woman she's beautiful. You should say, darling, your eyes are divine. Which I'd actually hate, but uh, Burton seems to have done all right with his ladies. <laughs> Uh, Prithu, what, what is your reaction to, to, to this well, sort of thing? What, what can I say? This is, this is modern society. Uh, we can understand, for example, take a dog. A dog is eating, a dog is sleeping, a dog has sex, and a dog defends himself. So if we, with our human intelligence, have nothing more to do but to intelligently eat, to sleep, to have sex, and to defend, then this is an intelligent dog society. This is our point. In fact, dogs are even better, because you don't see dogs aborting their children. You don't see dogs killing millions and millions of people simply by push-button system. It is actually almost an offense to call humans, uh, to compare a human society with a dog society, because the animals are actually better, because they at least follow the laws of nature. But human laws don't, human beings that don't follow the laws of God. It is clearly stated in all the scriptures of the world that one should use his body as a temple of God in the service of God. Now look at human society yourself. Now how would you answer that, Wendy? I would answer that you have every right to have your religion and, and there's nothing one can do other than respect well, it is not my religion. It is given in all the holy scriptures of the world the same thing. That one I would be the very last God. person to criticize anyone for their religion. I don't necessarily feel obliged to follow it. Um, what else can one say? Mind you, the book is a bit of a con book, Wendy, isn't it? Because, I mean, you, you, in the title, you hold out the offer to, for example, men who might be worried about this sort of thing. You hold out the offer that herein, in this manuscript, they're going to find the secret and they're going to be the Casanova, and they're going to be the greatest in the world, so that there's a long queue of women falling over each other to get to the front door. And they're going to find out by reading this book. But in fact, they don't. Are I mean, you sure about that? Well, well I mean, you, you tell me, for example, <laughs> what makes, after all the inquiries and all the interviews and all the prying and everything else, what makes well, a Well, let me answer bed? your first question um, to start with. First of all, the book is very gossipy. Lots of celebrities talk about how they feel about sex, but there are also interviews with male prostitutes for women and with porno stars who give very specific technical hints. And I don't think there's a man in Ireland or a man in England who couldn't do with reading some of those technical hints. At the point of death, at the point of death, there's no meaning to have such books in your mem remembrance. You are eternal. So what is the use of being engaged in these kind of nonsensical activities which will not save you at the point of death? Everybody can understand this. Everybody is a little religious. He must be ashamed to hear such things with his very ears. But this is not the way. Now, I have, to, I have to stop you there. I mean, obviously, you haven't read the book, and I wouldn't expect you to read the book. It's but, all about sex. But no, let me, fin let me finish. <laughs> let me yes, finish. Yes, it is. Yes, we yes, can't deny is. that. Yes, but it I've is. Never, sex is I've considered never, a shackle time, in the soul. I've never at any time in the book said that anyone is under any obligation to be, in quotes, good in bed. In fact, what I'm saying is that there's too much pressure in our modern society for people to act up to sexual stereotypes. Indeed, you do. And I'm definitely definitely certain that it's far too fashionable at the moment for women to be over kind of sexy to enjoy sex and one of the important things in the book is that very many glamorous men say they don't want a woman don't need a woman who is incredibly sexy a lot of women say women like anthea redfern say well look i don't always feel sexy i don't always want a lot of sex and in fact the book yes, I think it should be called garbage and books Garbage in book, yeah. rather than good in bed. Yeah. Thank yeah. you very much. <laughs> Garbage in book. And this is a book that you need to write. All right, with
with that, we say goodnight to you. Thank you for joining us until the next Saturday night on The Late Late Show. Goodbye. Peace.